our scripture reading, kindly open your Bible from Matthew 28 verses 1 to 10. Matthew 28 verses 1 to 10. I will be reading from New King James Version. Now after the Sabbath, at the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee, there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and ran to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. May God bless the reading of his word. Today is a very great day for each one of us. If we are call ourselves Christians, and we say we are born again believers because we are talking about Christ who died and rose again for our sins, your sins, and mine. So why do we celebrate this? Something that happened approximately more than 2,000 years ago. It's an historical fact. It didn't happen in secret. The whole city of Jerusalem came to hear about it. Eventually, the Roman Empire were aware, and then the whole world. There are 15 historical references which show that Jesus rose and met with many people, talked to them, and in fact, once even made breakfast for his group. For Christians, what does this mean? the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. If we accept his sacrifice, accept him as our Lord and Savior, we are promised life after death. We have hope for a better life. We can have joy no matter what the circumstances. The basis of our faith should be in Jesus. We have victory over death hell, and the grave. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we would be wasting our time coming here week after week and professing our faith. The words, he is not here, he is risen, has changed the course of history. So we look now at Matthew 28, 1 to 10. We go verse by verse. We're told now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. Here we are told of only two Marys, but in Mark chapter 16, verse 1, it says, Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices that they may come and anoint him. Three women over there. And Matthew 27, 56 tells us that mother of Zebedee's son, James and John, was Salome. Now these three women, they had interacted with Jesus when he was alive. They loved him. They wanted to serve him. They seen what happened to him when he was crucified. They were devastated. But the very next day, they get up and take the spices and are on their way to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body, honoring him after his death. 
the courage, the intention, the devotion of these three women who are heartbroken. They are on their way, but they are still stuck in the past. The reason I say that is they didn't expect Jesus to rise again. Jesus had said it several times that he will rise again. But here they are going to the tomb and on the way they must have been wondering who will take away the stone. They were going there without any expectation but they experienced something great when they reached there. Many of us today may have come to church thinking that we will hear a nice message and go back. But maybe during the praise and worship time the Lord nudged at your heart. You had an encounter with Jesus. I tell you, when you praise and worship him with your whole heart, mean every word that you sing, you will definitely, definitely have that encounter. So when you come for the service, leave all your problems outside the door. Come in just because you're coming to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He has done something great for you by dying on the cross. Taking your sins and mine. We need to come with reverence. We need to come with awe that a King, a Lord, a God is interested in each one of us. The Lord says, draw near to me. And I will draw near to you. Are you drawing near to him? Verse 2 tells us, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. World-changing event. The earth quaked the first time when Jesus was on the cross and the curtain split. And now again there is an earthquake. The stone is moved. A violent earthquake we are told. Now we know that the events of Good Friday and Easter Sunday, that is the rock splitting into two, the dead rising, the earthquake, the angel descending and sitting there, are all supernatural events. The resurrection signaled a new era for each one of us. The Lord had come back and said, this kingdom which was lost in the Garden of Eden is being purchased back. We are being redeemed because of that sacrifice. People often ask, why was the stone rolled away? It was not for him to come out. It for us to peek inside. And every one of us should know that when we peek inside, we see that the body is not there. We are reminded what he said, I will rise again on the third day. Evidence to all of us that Jesus is alive. The third verse, his countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. This is the description of the angels. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. They were there supposed to guard. But I tell you, if there's a violent earthquake and suddenly the stone moves, and then you see someone sitting there, you definitely will be shocked. We'll be thinking, what's happening out here? They were shaken. There was a man quake, you can say. There was an earthquake, they say. But we say man quake. You remember Paul and Silas, they were in the jail, they were imprisoned. They're singing praises and worship to our Lord. And at midnight we are told there was a violent earthquake. The foundation of the prison shook, the doors flew open and all of their chains came loose. The jailer when he came to know about it, he was about to kill himself. When Paul says, don't harm yourself, we are all here. Immediately, what does the jailer do? Takes Paul and Silas, 
takes care of their wounds and then says, what should I do to be saved? So that day it was not him only who was saved. It was his family as well. So a real man quick. God knows how to get you if you're trying to avoid him. He can do anything and get your attention. The next verse says, But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. Mark 16, 3 says, They had been saying, that is the three women are saying among each other, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? Jesus has been preparing everyone, telling them that, I will rise again. So, when they see that the stone is moved, that stone would have been one to two tons approximately. They have arrived there. They see that the stone is moved. The body of Jesus is not there. They enter. They see a young man there in white robes. And they are alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who has, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. They shocked. Where is he then? They couldn't believe it. Luke 1, 12 says, and with Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. This is the father of John the Baptist. When he encountered the angel, Matthew 14, 30 says, But when he, that is Peter, saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Let me tell you something about fear or alarm and faith. When you trust your God, there will never be fear, whatever circumstances that you may be going through. You have nothing to fear because he says, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. When you have that promise, then you shouldn't be saying, where is my God? I've been praying, where is he? He does not hear my prayer. Instead, keep saying, thank you, Jesus. I have received the answer. You don't see it, but you thank him in faith. You trust that your God who says... He will not leave you nor forsake you, will never leave you. He will be with you. We usually put God in a box and say, this is how I want my answer. And when that doesn't match, then we think what's happening here. Every one of us goes through trials and tribulation. When you have fear, your faith will go away. But if you have faith in God, Fear has to flee. You have to remember that. You cannot say, I prayed and I think I'll get my answer. When you see there's no answer coming, your faith goes down. When that happens, it's like a wave of the sea. You say, I'm receiving something, I will get an answer. Then nothing happens. Then again you pray, again nothing happens. And by the time that tide reaches the shore, it flattens out, there is nothing. You will also receive nothing if you waver in your faith. Make sure your faith is strong. When you are going through troubles, the devil will keep telling you you are praying, it's no use. But you tell him, you need to keep quiet because my God will not leave me nor forsake me. My God is able. My God is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he is still on the throne. When you say that in faith, you will see, you will receive answers to whatever dilemma you are going through. Maybe today, God is going to give you an unexpected discovery. If you come here with a heart, with some burden on your heart, trust that you will receive your answer. He is not here, he is risen. As he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay. In other words, the angel is saying, why are you looking for 
the living among the dead. Jesus has risen. He is alive. If Jesus is alive, then you know we should all be saying to Satan, why not this trouble come to me? God will see me through. It is one more chance I get to flex my faith muscle. When you do that, you will see that you will see answers to your prayer. So there is a new unexpected reality. Jesus is resurrected. So the women know that the prophecy of death and resurrection has come true. Are you looking for the living among the dead? I'm telling you today, he is risen. He is not here. Don't go looking for the dead when he tells you he is alive. Don't get stuck in the past. Always, if you say you're a believer, show that you have faith and you will see the mountains move. Verses 7 to 9. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and ran to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. In Matthew 28, the command, go, is there three times. The first time, the angel tells the two Marys, go quickly and tell his disciples. When Jesus, they tried to get hold of him, grab him and worship him, he said, go and tell my brothers in Galilee. And the third time, when the eleven go to Galilee, they worship, but Jesus says, therefore, go. This amazing news about the resurrection of Jesus was not only for them, it's not only for us, it's for the world to hear. And that's why he said, go. We need to go, get out of the comfort zone and go and make disciples. Go, there's work to be done. Resurrection and mission go together. You cannot say resurrection and happy resurrection day and then continue the same way. Happy resurrection day, he ascended into heaven and said, go. Are you willing to go? It's not for just coming to church, hearing the word of God and go. Resurrection should be our work moving out of our comfort zone and seeing who we can bring into his kingdom. Jesus' heart, he had a passion to seek and save the lost. That's why he came out of his comfort zone to live here on earth. He gave us the same command, go. Ask yourself if you're willing to do that. There are broken people, hurting people, people who are dying daily still without knowing the Lord Jesus. Do you have that burden on you that they are going to hell because I did not move and go and give them the good news about the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus wants us to go sharing the good news of, in word and in deed. The promise I am with you is connected with therefore go. It's in the going that we encounter the fullness of and the presence of Jesus. Then he says, tell his disciples. Matthew, uh, no, sorry, Mark 16, 7 says, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. Peter was one of the disciples. Why is the angel specifically saying Peter? Because by this time, Peter doesn't feel he is one of the disciples because he betrayed Jesus. He said boldly, even if everyone else lets you down, Jesus, I will not. 
That's why when you brag and boast, you got to be careful. You need to have substance. But in the end, we know that he stood. He was even martyred. But we need to know that when we say something, we should stand by it. He may have been thinking about Judas and would have thought, I think I need to do the same thing. But the word the angel is giving, that Jesus is giving through the angels, telling Peter, I'm still alive. I want to see you. I'm not yet done with you. Come. Have you ever felt like Peter? I have messed it all up. Well, Jesus is good at making a message out of all the messes. So if you have a mess, go to Jesus. He will show you how he can clean it up. The good news is Jesus is alive. He is not here. He has risen. The religious leaders, other religious leaders, they have gone. But our Jesus, he is alive. Jesus is alive today, sitting at the right hand of the Father and interceding for each one of us. He has sent his Holy Spirit to be with us. So, he has not left us as orphans. What we need to do then is believe Whatever happens, my God is not going to leave me. He promised he will not leave me. And he is definitely going to see me through. They were full of joy. The two Marys arrived there to anoint the cops. They were sad. They were broken. They were grieving. But by the time when they encountered Jesus, they left with joy. Get up every morning and say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Look into the mirror when you brush your teeth. Smile at yourself and say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And you will see, it really will be your strength. They were happy. You know, they were trying to keep it from the other. The, they were told not to tell that the body was not there. So, it spreads, the news spreads that Jesus has risen. It went faster than coronavirus. Quick, it was there. And everywhere they went and said, Jesus has, is alive. There was joy. Joy. We should be filled with joy today. Why? Jesus is alive. He is the king of kings. And that's the king of kings that I worship. We should be people of joy. Joy is crucial in our mission. Joy should be seen among believers. So that the others will feel. What is in this church? What is in among these people? That they are filled with joy at all times. Don't cry over things that go wrong. We are never told that Christianity means that the only good things will happen. In fact, if Jesus had to go through trials, if the apostles had to go through trials, then we are not exempt from it. But we have support. We have Jesus who says, I will not leave you. You have the Holy Spirit whom you can talk to. We have to live each day trusting that our God is in control. Give him control of your life and you will see that well, come what may, you will be at peace. You will have the joy of the Lord. Jesus will turn your fear into peace, our discipleship into brotherhood, our worship into mission and our grief into joy. And the change will be seen by all. We will never be the same again. And that what is seen among us should then move to the community. In Acts chapter 17, Paul and Silas were accused of turning the world upside down. Are you turning your world upside down with the word of God? You should do it at your workplace. You should do it wherever you go. So that the others will say, 
Yeah, there is something there. My prayer is that the same will be said about each one of us. John 4, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except by me. He didn't say, I am one way, I am a good way, or I am one of the ways. If you want to dial emergency, you don't dial two, three numbers. You've been given a number that you got to dial when you are in an emergency. So, in the same way, one way, Jesus. There's a song, right? One way, Jesus. Then, he says, I am the truth. That means, any other way is not the truth. He claimed to be God. No one can get to God the Father except through me. He said it and he means it. You know, when Jesus came into the world, we, there is a reference point. When you write out a check, you write a date. When you write that date, it's either AD or BC. And that date refers to the coming of Jesus before Christ or after his death. When he said, he is God. He is God and he is the reference point. Every time you write a date, remember, Jesus is the reference point. He said and he meant who he claimed to be. So we need time to rest at Jesus' feet, get our batteries charged so that we can go out and disciple others. But it doesn't mean that you get charged and don't use it at all. Because we got to get charged so that we can go out. But doesn't mean we just... Sometimes you may be running out without the help of the Holy Spirit. You hear of people say, I'm going to evangelize. I'm going to speak to so and so. Did you speak to so and so? Before you speak to so and so, please speak to him. And ask him, is this the right time for me to speak to so and so about you? God will make a way when we do it the right way. We need to receive and we need to give. And you know it's said that it's really good to give than to receive. So we need to ask the Lord to make a shift from hard hearts and soft feet to soft heart and hard feet so that we can go and minister. We need to let worship lead us into mission. Verse 10, Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. Jesus had told his disciples he was preparing them every time saying he was going to die and he would be rising again. Mark 10, 45 says that he had come to give his life as a ransom for many. In other words, his death would get us freedom from sin. Mark 14, 28, after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Well, he already said that. Sometimes we come to church we hear the word of God. I think I, as soon as we walk out of the door, we've forgotten what was said. Why? Because we don't concentrate on what is being said. We need to be not only hearers of the word and to be doers, we need to re retain it there so that we can do what we are told to do. Dead people don't usually come back to life, so they would have thought it's not possible. But see these three ladies, they go there and they become the first preachers of the gospel, the first missionaries and the first witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. Uh, women, okay, in those days, they, nobody treated them in, on par with men. They were treated, they were not even allowed to give witness in a court of law. They were thought to be untrustworthy witnesses. I'm asking each one of you, are you a trustworthy witness? 
Jesus can use anyone. It doesn't have to be women or men. He can use anyone who is ready. Who says, here I am, use me. Lord, I am ready. I have time. But mostly we will say, do you, can you do this? I'm busy. I don't think I have time. Do you use that word often? Well, get that off your mouth and ask the Lord to help you prioritize your day and you will find time for God. As they go, they meet Jesus on the way. Suppose you're going out now and you have an encounter with Jesus and he's telling you, don't be afraid. You're going because there is a mountain there, you've got a problem. He's telling you, don't be afraid. He tells us that often. He said it many times in the scriptures. The disciples, especially Peter, when he got off the boat, he was looking on to Jesus and walking on water. The minute he took his eyes off Jesus and started looking at the storm, he was sinking. But at least he had the mind to think and say, Lord, save me. You do it. We see after that, the angel tells the two Marys, go and tell his disciples that Jesus is alive. But he says, go and tell my brothers. A subtle but profound shift. It was all along, these were trainees. Three and a half years trainees. What happened after that? Jesus called them brothers. Family. Jesus died on the cross, saved us. We are now Jesus' brothers and sisters. Hell. co heirs with him. He has called you into the family. He wants to share everything that he has with you. Jesus' death brought us forgiveness. Jesus' death has got us eternal life. Jesus' death has got us a family. They are brothers and sisters. And that was God's plan all along from the time of Garden of Eden. So Jesus shows us that he has power he came to have. He said, all power on earth and in heaven is given to me. In John 10, 18, he says, nobody takes my life for me. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up. No force. They killed him. They put him in the tomb. They sealed it. They kept guard 24 hours. But, when the time came, Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus does what he promises to do. Mark 10, 34. They will mock and flog and kill me, but after three days, I will come back to life. He did what he promised. When God makes a promises and you find a promise here in the word of God, it's a and amen. Nobody can take it away from you. Claim it. Trust. And you see that when Jesus says he's doing something, he does it. Because of the resurrection, your past can be forgiven. Are you walking along with some excess baggage? Even if you take excess baggage and go to the airport, you have to pay a fine. You have to pay excess money. Don't carry excess baggage. The Lord says, cast all your cares upon me for I care for you. He will take care of it. Give it to him. Don't be stuck in the past. If you're stuck in the past, you can't move forward. There is no condemnation awaiting those who belong to Jesus. Jesus says no condemnation at all. Repent and get back to him. Your present problem can be managed. Much of our life, we don't know what it has in store for us. We are unable to manage. If you think you figured it all out, I'm sure you haven't. Maturity means we don't know what is in store. 
but our God knows. So if he knows the present and the past and the future, why not tell him? Like Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but your will be done in my life. And you see, you'll be at peace because you know that your God is in control. Your future can be secure. Of all the universal problems that we have, we have death. Someday, all of us are going to die. So that's something you can't just leave it aside. Saying that, well, when I get old, I'll tackle it. Call somebody to your place and say, let's talk about death. Nobody would want to talk about death. Let me give you something. Some children were asked to write sentences in what they believed about death. Gilda, age eight, says, when you die, they put you in a box and bury you in the ground because you don't look so good. Stephanie, age nine, doctors help you so you don't die until you pay the bill. Marsha, age nine, when you die, you don't have homework to do unless your teacher is there too. <laughs> Raymond, age 10, a good doctor can help you so you won't die. A bad doctor sends you to heaven. This is what children think. Even for us today, all of us, we think if someone would come back from there and tell us what it is like over there, we would be more peaceful. But I say, if you have got a God who tells you he is in control, he knows everything, just give him control and you will see you'll be at peace. Do the right things. Don't do wrong things and expect peace. Do the right things. So we see everyone has that anxiety. What will happen? When will I die? Don't worry about anything. Your days are numbered. When your call comes, you can't say, wait another five minutes. You got to be ready. So be ready at all times. When, why did Jesus need to die? Is some of the questions they ask when you tell, when you go to evangelize. Why couldn't God have reconciled humanity to himself in any other way? Well, it started in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. And it culminates with a new heaven and a new earth in Revelations 21. Jesus had to die. You know, when God created everything, he said, it is good. Then who made it bad? Man's sin. So he had to do something about it. The law couldn't heal our brokenness from sin. We earned death because of sin. The wages of sin is death and Jesus paid that price. He could pay the price because he was sinless. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So we see righteousness of Christ, God, sorry. So Jesus took on the cross our past sins, our present sins and our future sins. And all of it is nailed to the cross. We don't have to carry it at all. If we had to pay the price, I'm sure it would have been very, very difficult. Then we see at the Last Supper, Jesus demonstrated his love. John 13, 34 to 35 says, Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another, it didn't say only people who love you. We love to love people who love us or if we can get something from them. What about the others? But in John 15, Jesus again says, love one another, but he adds one more verse there. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. And Jesus laid down his life and showed us what love is. And if we are Christians, he expects us 
to do the same. Jesus demolished Satan's plan. Don't fall in for Satan's plan. You remember in the Garden of Eden, he will tell you half-truths. You fall for it. And then after that, once he has done his job, you no more hear of him later troubling Eve because he got what he wanted and he got Eve to go against God. Why does the resurrection matter? Paul explains it beautifully in 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 19. But it, if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him. In fact, the dead are not raised. If the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You, will, you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ. We are all, of all people, most to be pitied. If you say you are a Christian, you are headed to heaven and Jesus hasn't raised, been raised and he's still in the grave, they will say, what kind of faith is this? So because Jesus is alive, we have that faith that one day he's coming back for us and we know where we, if we accept him as our Lord and Savior, we will be with him in heaven. What more do you expect your God to do for you? You remember today is resurrection day. You have to be dead to be resurrected. Are you dead in your sins and want to be resurrected? New man. If your new man is still continuing, your old man is still doing the things that he was doing or she was doing when you were born again, then resurrection is going to have no meaning. Resurrection, you talk about baptism. You're dipped into the water. You leave your old self there. Come out, new man. Not that we don't sin after that. But we try. Say, Lord, help us to walk with you daily. So resurrection. Jesus rose from the dead. You have a promise. You have a hope. He's coming back for you. Are you happy about it that he's coming, that he gave himself up for you and for me? So what do we do? We should be thankful. We should praise him. We should thank him. Lord, if I had to be in that place and get that many beatings and that nails to be pierced in my hand and my leg, I would have been crying. But our God bore it all because he loved us. Be thankful. Your Jesus loved you so much. He knows everything about you. All he's saying is, live a life. When you go out, they will say, there is something in this person, something that shows that they're doing what God wants them to do. Living lives that are pleasing unto him. Every time you got to make a decision, ask the Lord, is this right for me to do? Am I doing the right thing, Lord? Like I said, I think two weeks back, visit the shepherd shop, find a bracelet, WWJD. What would Jesus do? And you will find when you do things, that Jesus would do, your life here will be pleasing unto him. Amen? Ask the Lord to show you what you need to change so that 
you can have a walk that's pleasing unto him father we just come into your presence today is resurrection day we remember what your son jesus did on the cross just to get redeem us lord we said my redeemer lives my redeemer is alive my redeemer cares for me lord let us come into your presence knowing that you are alive and that you want to have a fellowship with us you want us to commune with you daily help us to lead a life that's pleasing unto you you've given us the holy spirit help us to talk and ask guidance help needed when we are in trouble lord we just want to do things that are pleasing unto you we love you lord we just want to say thank you for dying on the cross for us we love you master in jesus mighty and matchless name we pray amen god bless you